Um, and I'll hand it over to Dana to give us uh, some of the background on the first handful of slides. Thank you, Nate. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining uh, us this morning and for giving us your time. So uh, Vineyard Wind uh, was established in 2010 and it's uh, two companies combined and they are Copenhagen Infrastructure Partners and Avangrid Renewables. It's based in New Bedford, Mass, where I live, uh, but there's also office in Boston, Massachusetts and in Bridgeport, Connecticut. Uh, currently Vineyard Wind holds two federal leases um, and the projects are Vineyard Wind One, which is in Massachusetts and Park City Wind, which is in Connecticut. So now we're gonna get, so why offshore wind in New England? Um, you can see from this map, the tangerine and orange, uh, that indicates the most robust uh, and high density wind. And also New England is, uh, you know, we're, we're close to one another, we're small cities, so it's, it's a perfect marriage. And uh, the waters compared to other places are, are relatively uh, shallow. So we really are primed for this industry. We can go to the next. Oh, great. So uh, 2015, that banana color, that was the first uh, lease awarded to uh, Vineyard Wind. And the green color on the bottom, 2018, that was the uh, second lease that was awarded. And that is uh, what the wind farm looks like. In 2008, Massachusetts passed the Global Warming Solutions Act. And the goal of that was um, to cut down on carbon emissions that are released and then in 2010, the federal siting process begins. Now you can see clearly that the 2010 map is, is a, a considerably larger than the 2015 map. Um, one, of the, one of the excellent parts of this planning was that there were so many people invited to the table. So it was organizations that worked to protect uh, mam mammal life uh, and marine life. It was fishermen, um, it were people from Martha's Vineyard people from Nantucket, everybody got to weigh in. And so that's why the, uh, the second map at 2015 is 60% smaller than the first to take into consideration all the needs from, um, from all the uh, entities that came to the table to discuss you know, what their concerns were with having such a large initial map. Uh, in 2016, um, when you look at the picture, you see everything from the governor to, uh, to some of our, the delegation that is on the other side of the uh, aisle, Democrats, and they passed the Energy Diversity Act. So what they recognized was that um, in order to continue the work of the act in 2008, that uh, wind was a good way to go, but also that it was a strong and viable industry that's been taking place in Europe for decades. It was a new industry and it would provide real opportunity for, uh, for people in Massachusetts. Uh, the first procurement uh, process was initiated and that was a competitive uh, procurement, which is good uh, obviously for the rate payers, for myself and yourself included. Uh, 2019, we saw that up and down the Eastern seaboard, this industry is growing. And uh, what's resulted in 2021 is, um, I think it's coming up. Oh. It, uh, 2020 okay. and 2021 is uh, setting higher goals for uh, for what we want to procure in terms of wind, which shows again that we're really seeing that this is a real viable industry and a great a great path for us to take in terms of not only cleaning up our environment but producing sustainable energy and a real uh, boost to our job to our job front. Great. Uh, so uh, yeah, so Dana sort of illustrated the um, the way that that the lease areas sort of have moved through a process, and that process started as you as you can see there. You know, it took several years with states or um, Massachusetts being being first among them, um, sort of requesting that the government initiate a process, and then several years of, um, of of you know dozens of hearings and stakeholder input in order to just in order to define those lease areas themselves. Um, which was, was of course, um, no matter what side you were on, it is certainly a distinction from what the Cape Wind um, model brought us, which was, which was where you know, sort of a developer would define uh, where these areas, um, where, where the area for development would be. Um, so that, that distinction really, really sort of hardwires in 
um, you know, some of the core elements of uh, stay out of areas with, with high fishing uh, activity, with high navigation importance, stay, stay uh, away from areas that are major migratory pathways or habitat for endangered species. Um, and, and then also, as, as Dana mentioned, the islands, uh, especially in the Cape, being involved in, in pushing these, these, uh, these facilities uh, areas um, further from shore, uh, addressing viewshed issues and those kinds of conflicts. So after that um, you know, process went through, you know, we then talk about the specific uh, projects. So um, we get through the blue here and into the um, sort of the blue green. And then we talk about the, the multi-year process. Uh, and in fact, sort of a, even a, multiple more years than we had originally anticipated process uh, for permitting an actual project. Um, so that involves acquiring, after acquiring the lease, doing, doing um, uh, submitting plans to do survey and, and, and site assessment uh, on the area. And that's an a, 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 a extensive amount of not only sort of geotechnical, like what's on the sea bottom, what are the sea conditions, what is the wind regime, but also um, ex extensive work with respect to um, fisheries surveys, uh, endangered species surveys, migratory, um, uh, you know, bird and marine mammal uh, surveys to really develop um, a far richer, uh, you know, uh, granular understanding of that space, both in terms of how um, feasible and, and, and what features the development, you know, the actual placement and operation of, of, of the facility infrastructure, essentially poles and wires uh, and, you know, wires under the seabed. Um, and, uh, and, and then also, how, you know, what the potential interactions um, are at a granular level with respect to, um, you know, to birds, fish, whales, and, and those kinds of, um, you know, important resources. Um, the construction and operations plan is submitted, and that's a, a substantial document which describes the sort of what we call the envelope, meaning the sort of lower and upper bound of potential development. Um, and, uh, and it is essentially the sort of the engineering plan, the fundamentals, um, the logistics plan in terms of how um, the, uh, the facility is intended to be built and then operated. Um, and then that moves through a two year process, um, which you, you folks may have heard the acronyms, uh, uh, the EIS, the DEIS, SEIS, and, 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 uh, and, and finally the FEIS, that's the environmental impact statement, which the federal government produces through an iterative process again with multiple hearings, uh, stakeholder input over, um, over multiple years um, to get to final, which is a final sort of, uh, you know, design and, um, and uh, authorization uh, from, from, in this case, uh, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management and the Department of the Interior. Uh, so I'm not, let me see if I've got us. So what we've been hearing in the news, both with Vineyard Wind specifically and more broadly with offshore wind and the, and the administration, as well as the state's um, uh, ambitions, as, as Dana had characterized, a lot is moving led by the states. Um, and then we've, we're, we're, you know, in, in recent weeks, even just hearing, hearing uh, a lot of um, boost in the, in the offshore wind initiative. Vineyard Wind itself is really at the, at the very uh, cusp uh, of, 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 the, of the final permitting of Vineyard Wind 1, which is anticipated actually this month. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I can recall being with you folks in, uh, gosh, it was early 2018, I believe, uh, when Vineyard Wind, um, you know, was, was sort of in the um, kind of the, the, the yellow zone here um, and, and, and uh, really, you know, hoping to win uh, an actual, um, you know, be selected for, for a project. Um, so now we're moving on, you know, th three years from that time. And, and of course, these documents have been submitted, you know, in 2017, we're, we're, we're going to be upwards of five years uh, from just that individual th individual um, project uh, original submission. And we're going all the way back in 2009 um, from when this set, this new stage is offshore in 2.0 area set of lease areas began to be reviewed. And then we can go all the way back to 2001, where a lot of us uh, on this call, you know, will recall the first proposal for offshore wind um, in Cape Wind. Uh, so it's, it's been a long process. Uh, and, and so you look at this, this slide, which is lengthy and exhaustive, and, and, and you realize that even back behind the black, you know, off to the left of your screen would be, would be that original uh, foray that, that the US and that our, our region had with offshore wind. Uh, so it, it is really an exciting time. Um, it's, it, it's rapidly moving at this point uh, after, after many years of sort of <laughs> contemplative thought and, uh, and, and discourse uh, and of course, you know, dialogue and sometimes disagreement. Um, so I don't know if, if this might be a good opportunity to pause uh, for, for questions. Um, and I don't know if I should, should stop sharing or if Austin, if you wanted to 
jump in if there's not been anything that's popped up in the chat or if there's any questions you think we ought to field here. Sure. So, um, you know, you, you talked about the important role the federal government plays in this process. And just very briefly, I was wondering if you could touch on what, if anything, the change in the federal administration has meant specifically for the Vineyard Wind projects. And then maybe at the end of their time, we'll get your thoughts on what it might mean for the industry in general moving forward. Sure, sure. I, I'll take the second question last. I mean, you're, you're hearing um, a, a, a very strong and assertive medium term commitment from the federal government, uh, from the administration, um, as, as far as what our goals are. I mean, uh, the, the Biden administration announced 30 by 30, uh, 30 gigawatts by 2030. And just backing up for one moment, I'm re remembering this gigawatt, megawatt, me a lot of you on the call uh, on this are a little more familiar with the terms. Think of a megawatt as five as as, as capable of serving five thousand homes, and a gig and a gigawatt. No, excuse me, megawatt five thousand. See, I'm even losing my chart, my train of thought here. Um, uh, yeah, a, a, a megawatt serving five thousand homes and a gigawatt serving uh, about five hundred thousand homes. Um, so when we talk about thirty gigawatts, we're talking about power for, for roughly fifteen million homes. And as Dana it, it, it showed in that map, um, you know that on the east coast and the north. We have this density and this close proximity to those energy resources um, that, that is actually attainable. Now, there's some sort of, you know, uh, need for some grid upgrades towards the latter stage of, of, of that 30 gigs. Uh, but you're also hearing from Bohm that, 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 you know, that it's attainable. Um, with Vineyard Wind 1 specifically, I mean, it's, it's tough to calculate. We did have a productive relationship with the previous administration and the previous staffs who were reviewing this project. And actually, I mean, many of those um, staff that have, have been you know reviewing and 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 moving this this uh, project through the process are still in place um you know we we had a um you know we had obviously a delay for the uh, last uh, what was it now august of 19 and then and then uh, last summer uh, a supplemental environmental impact statement which sought to take kind of the more long view and look at what the cumulative build out would mean in terms of impact, benefit, um, and, uh, and and changes, and uh, you know that was a process that was you know as we had we're at the cusp of, of getting our final approval, you know it was of course frustrating, but um, it you know it did lead you know it it did allow for that larger uh, context to be analyzed, and I think um, you know with the final environmental impact statement having been issued um, you know just recently. Um, and, and, and a timeline put out, I mean, that is all firmed up, uh, you know, it's, it, who, who's to say what, what would have, you know, come out of the, out of the previous administration, um, because they were sort of on a similar timeline, I think. Um, we did have one delay there, uh, wherein um, we were, we were able to incorporate uh, this larger turbine model, which you may have heard about, which is actually very exciting, uh, and, and it really, um, we're just really excited that we're, we're able to, to, you know, bring that into the, uh, into this, uh, you know, first in the nation project, um, and we'll talk a little more about that later. But um, the, uh, you know, it, there there is a moment when you make one of the, more, the most fundamental design decisions, um, and and awkwardly it kind of happened at this at this sort of end of the year. And I think, you know, the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management had 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 you know issued a a further very modest delay and said you know there's going to be another few weeks before we can issue this. And in the meantime, we had this. Um, this major design design feature uh, cemented, so so it, it afforded us the opportunity to avoid potential delays down the, down the line where, where we need to uh, amend our our project post you know after we get all of our approvals and then we we then we finally you know are able to do the due diligence to ensure that um, this 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 new um, you know new and more efficient turbine works. So um, that's a long winded way of saying it, you know it, it, it's. It, it's generally good, I suppose, for Vineyard Wind One, but really, um, you know, we anticipated being able to move through the process in either scenario. Um, but obviously, for for, for offshore wind in general, it's a um, major. You know, it, it it appears that this has become a major priority for the administration. I would add that it, there's a there's a post um, partisan air in many of the rooms you get in that this is no longer sort of a highly controversial and charged issue. There are Republicans and Democrats, um, and independents and others that are that are seeing this as an industry. As a um, as an as an environmental effort as well as a labor effort, um, so so it's uh, it's exciting on that front. 
thanks for that behind the scenes glimpse there. And I know that Jane uh, asked who we can write to uh, stop obstructing this. It sounds like maybe some of that obstruction has, is no longer as much of an issue, um, but maybe at the end we can have some next steps uh, for anyone who wants to get involved. So sure. Any, um, other questions, I'm mindful of the time and I think they may be relevant to some of the sections you guys are gonna be presenting. So I'll let you- Sure, well, let's, let me can move through these and then we'll, and you know, for some of these and then we'll, have other occasions to check because we, we like we like the dialogue and it's, it's so dynamic these days the dialogue is often more productive than the slides which can become stale after even a couple of days but uh let me um nate i just uh, someone asked me a question privately which i don't know the answer to so maybe you can help out it says what is the relative cost of an offshore windmill versus a comparable land-based windmill I'm that is a, it's a very complicated question. I mean, off, onshore wind, the, the short answer is onshore wind has a far lower capital sort of investment cost. Um, but depending on where those, that facility is placed, offshore wind has, has, a, has a, a, an extremely uh, high um, um, uh, capacity factor. In other words, an offshore wind facility, while more expensive to build, is far more productive um, with far fewer uh, uh, units installed. So. Um, it can vary, um, but but uh, I would I would describe onshore wind as more of a low hanging fruit, and offshore wind as more of a larger long term and base load um, uh, potential investment. And you saw the the picture. We can get that back to you that that Dana had showed about the wind resources onshore and offshore. You know, it's possible you could put a, a turbine in the plains of Iowa uh, or or somewhere in Alaska and and, and see um, you know an extraordinary level of efficiency. Um, but, but you know, it, it's a sort of a case by case basis. Offshore wind is highly productive and sort of is the most uh, close to base load uh, of any renewable uh, resource. Um, so let's talk about responsible development. This is really the kind of what, what sort of led the, the, the discussion um, in, in, in this offshore wind 2.0 and it certainly defined Vineyard Wind's early work. Um, we have um, over, the, over the last several years been able to um, achieve a number of critical agreements um, our, our local community agreements are, are, are very important, and we know that local communities have played an ex ex extremely high, you know, involved role in the siting and, and the way these, these uh, projects move through the process. So our host community with the town of, uh, agreement with the town of Barnstable um, was, was a, a, a sort of a critical partnership. That's the, where the onshore, you know, the landfall for the cable and the onshore infrastructure will be, will be um, placed. Uh, we have some of the details of that uh, in later slides. Uh, but this was an area where we, we started at, 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 you know, at opposite ends of the room. Uh, Barnstable's, uh, you know, the, the wounds of, of, of Cape Wind, no matter what side you were on, were very fresh. And there was a lot of, it was a charged atmosphere. Um, so um, we started, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a tough spot. But um, fortunately, both the community, the, the town council and town staff um, said, let's, let's see if we can resolve these problems. Let's see if, if, if there is an opportunity and, and making no guarantees. After a couple of years of, of pretty intense discussion, we were able to achieve an agreement that really makes us partners. Um, it provides for some revenue and some protections that are significant for the town. Um, and it also allows us to have a, a sort of a clear pathway for development. Um, the Vineyard Power uh, Agreement that we have with the uh, community nonprofit over there um, really is a, is a foundational piece of our, um, of our project. We, um, you know, they led the charge as far as how do we do, have a more community involved uh, uh, process. And uh, this was sort of beside any, any agreements that, that they had with Vineyard Wind, they kind of predated Vineyard Wind. Uh, and so it, it's, it's, you know, really exciting to have, have sort of been able to embrace them as a partner and, and, to, and to work, uh, work with them and work with initiatives on the island in terms of workforce, as well as that community involvement. And more recently, a community partnership with the town of Nantucket, um, you know, some similar concerns on the historic nature of that island. Um, we, we worked with the staffs there as well as the Board of Selectmen and community members um, to achieve an agreement with, with them. Um, you know, secondly, it's, it's uh, agreements around environmental protection and a close dialogue and working relationship, not only with, with national NGOs who are, are really kind of, you know, major stewards of, 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 our, of our environment, especially our oceans, um, but also with some of those groups that are engaged in a lot more, um, more of the science and conservation science. But our agreement with the North Atlantic, uh, around the North Atlantic right whale was, was, was really um, a, a cornerstone. And I think one that the um, NGOs were, were, were extremely interested in because they see these two conflicts, they see development in the oceans and at the same, uh, that is, that is uh, you know, 
that is necessary, but also comes with risks uh, working in the context of, of, of species like the North Atlantic right whale. So that, um, that agreement really, really set the stage, we hope, for, for further agreements and, 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 an, ex, and you know, an extraordinary consideration of, um, of marine uh, mammals and endangered species. Um, part, of, uh, you know, part of that same theme um, was a partnership that we have with Greentown Labs uh, as part of our Vineyard Wind One bid, which was a, a significant multi-million dollar investment in innovations around marine mammal technologies. So this idea about, about um, kicking that, moving that, that um, the chains forward in terms of, of, of bringing innovation, IoT and other things into um, the way we monitor and, and, and track right whales. Uh, you know, I, I grew up in a, in a sort of family that, that um, there's a lot of focus on right whales. And, and one of the, the, the critical things is, is um, you have to know where they are. It's the ship strikes and, 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 and entanglements with, um, you know, with fishing gear and marine debris. And um, understanding where these animals are um, in, a, in, a, in a way that is more sophisticated than airplanes and boat-based survey, although a lot of that is included in you know, as the backbone is, is, is important. And, and we, we hope that we can help sort of jump the science forward to, um, to, to learn more and learn, learn more quicker about these, these uh, animals, which as we all know are, 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 in, are in an increasingly difficult position. Um, you know, the science and research commitment weaves in and out of, of, of our permitting and, and also you know, involves, uh, you know, separate agreements that we have with groups like Mass Lobstermen's Association and others. Um, SMAST, we have such great resources in Southeastern Massachusetts and, um, and have, have sought to, to push forward some of the science. Again, to like with the right whale, not just in the context of offshore wind, but more broadly. So some of the uh, lobster research, I would note specifically, um, there have been, there's been grave concerns from the lobster, um, lobster industry about um, you know, the, 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 the ch rapidly changing dynamics of, of that fishery, that the waters are warming, lobsters are moving forward. There's a lot of assumptions made, but they've been, they've been really re you know, requesting Further research on what what has happened uh, over the in the recent decades to that to that resource, uh, and we've been able to work with them, uh, you know, and SMAST, uh, real real you know pine, you know experts in the field, some of the foremost on on figuring out you know what's going on out there. Um, obviously, collection of extensive fisheries data, um, and then and then you know this pre during and post construction monitoring um, of fisheries resources. Which is important, uh, you know, especially for the first project. And what we've seen in Europe is when they've done these studies, they've they've been able to come back with, um, you know, with a lot of um, of, of insight as to how a specific how a specific one of the earlier stage projects would inform future projects. And so we're hoping to be a part of that as well. Hey, we have a good before we move on from that. We have a good question from Steve in the chat who asked, you know, you mentioned the concerns from um, lobster fishermen, but could you talk a little? more broadly about the concrete steps that Vineyard Wind is taking to protect fishing and shell fishing in the region sure. which you're working? Sure, sure. Uh, yeah, shell fishing, shell fishing specifically is, is, has been a lesser, um, uh, lesser focus, especially, you know, in the context of our, off, of our uh, landfall options, you know, like shell fishing is typically, and I'm talking about aquaculture, is typically done in the near, near shore environment. And, and we, we meet with the um, shell fishermen in, um, have met with the shell fishermen in Barnesville uh, a number of times, uh, just for as FYI. But there's not a lot of, um, you know, that that type of, of work going on near shore. Um, of course, there's sea clamming and, and, and other fisheries, um, and it's important to highlight when we talk about fishing. It's not just some monolith. It's not one specific, you know, sector. You've got mobile gear. You've got fixed gear. Um, you've got, you know, you know, trawlers. You've got the sea clamors. You've got the the scallopers. Um, uh, and you've also got fixed gear, which, you know, which is the sort of the pot fisherman prime among them is lobstermen. Um, you know, the, the, there's been a, 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 a huge amount of evolution starting from, you know, we can start just post Cape Wind to when we first began to define these new lease areas. Uh, and it's important sort of for a bigger context and especially in the sort of fast moving sort of media environment we have, people can kind of see this as being, being new and, and fast moving and, and, and sort of having come out of nowhere. But in reality, um, fishing, you know, fishing interests and fishing advocates have been involved in the process since 2009, essentially, when, when these areas were first, um, uh, you know, first uh, considered. Um, when we, if we were to allude back to, and I wonder if I can get to it, to Dana's slide, uh, I will try and see if I can find this here. This is a, 
you know, a really important image here. Um, and it's this one. The first area that the government, that, that the federal government along with the states identified was, was, was a really substantial area. And that was the beginning of a conversation. One, if you know the area, you can look out to the east there and see all those check marked areas. Well, that, that's, that's, you know, prime scalloping, um, you know, that's, that's scalloping uh, uh, grounds. And there's some of the most productive scallop grounds, you know, that, that exist. Um, we also have, you know, there are sea duck migratory pathways, other, uh, other pieces in here. But, but what's important is that after, you know, dozens of hearings and several hundred comments, that's what led before the developer even entered the room to where these, these places were identified. Um, I would say that the, um, the refinements didn't stop there though. So, you know, if you look down and this is maybe actually could probably jump forward on this one. Oh, let me see if we've got a, the, the lease area itself, you know, it, as, as you can see in this picture, right? That's the sort of, that, that, that actually, that, you know, outline represents the large, the, the, the broadest envelope for Vineyard Wind One. And we, we talk about this envelope approach. It, it always leads to further and further refinements. So when we first uh, proposed Vineyard Wind One in 2017, we had a specific layout. It was sort of a diagonal um, uniform layout. Um, again, a uniform a trying, attempting to accommodate for, um, for shared use. Um, and can you guys still hear me? I want to make sure I just lost my headphones here. All right. Um, and, you know, that is about, you know, it's a, it's a consolation because the, the sort of a more scattershot or what would appear to be a random alignment is, um, is, a, is, 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 you know, significantly more efficient for offshore wind development, as well as a greater density. So you can put these things, you know, closer than a quarter mile apart and really maximize that. So what we were, we were doing even in 2017 was attempting to do uniform layout and attempting to provide enough space. At that point, it was about 0.7 um, nautical miles average spacing to accommodate for shared use. Moving forward in the process, um, you know, th that design envelope uh, uh, featured a larger turbine. And the larger turbine took our, our turbine locations down from 100 and uh, upwards of 106 down to 84. So it shrunk it by roughly a quarter. Um, when we, uh, you know, on this further discussion with fishing interests and, and, and with regulators, um, we uh, got to an agreement with offshore wind, the other offshore wind developers in the region to, to create a uniform, um, uniform layout that was east-west and had wider spacing. So we're now uh, in agreement on a one by one nautical mile east-west spacing. Um, and that, that, that was you know, a tremendous, tremendous development, the prime request um, from fishing interests as of, you know, as of 2019. Uh, and again, this is, you know, we're talking about nine years you know, after the sort of beginning of this, this discussion. Um, what is, you know, what's critical in understanding that too was the, was the, one of the number one things that fishermen will say to us is it doesn't matter that vineyard wind is here and Mayflower wind and some other developer there, they're all things in the ocean where, you know, they're, 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 there's, there's no difference, you know, in, the, in their phys physicality. So there needs to be coordination. So putting that uniform thing across all developers and having that agreement among, among developers was, was, was majorly significant. Um, the other piece of, of that comes mo more recently and it's on this slide here, we are using a 13 megawatt turbine, which once again, will shrink the footprint of the project by a quarter. So we're talking about 62 um, pilings in the ocean now. Um, so, you know, this stepwise process has, has, has really, you know, resulted in a steady reduction in footprint. Uh, and, and I would argue that you can put communities, fishermen, and environmental and, and, and conservation interests in sort of three pools of, of, of influencing this, um, this development. And I would argue that um, as far as the fundamentals of design, fishing interests have had more, more input uh, in, in terms of development of vineyard when one and sort of the, the trajectory of this, um, this industry than, than you know, nearly any other stakeholder. Um, so, you know, it, it's something where we're, we're pleased to see that evolution. We're pleased to see that, that potential for shared use, which is the ethos of, of, of these developments. Um, you know, there, there will be concerns and there will be conflicts, um, but we've, we've worked hard to, um, to, to, to mitigate those as well as providing 
research funding, long-term funding streams as well uh, for mitigation um, in the tens of millions of dollars. So um, you guys have seen these slides uh, before, many of you, uh, but when we're talking about Vineyard Wind One, um, we're talking about a project about 15 miles south of the islands. Um, began our permitting in 2017, and, we're, and, and we believe a record of decisions entered from the federal government, completed our state permitting, seen the agreements that we've got. Um, we anticipate beginning construction of this project uh, in the fall onshore, and then beginning our offshore work in, in 2022 with a commercial operation towards the end of 23. Um, and it's, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're feeling increasingly clear on the timeline, which is, as many of you have followed this for a long time, the, the timeline and, 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 and the, uh, the dates have always been, uh, they've always seemed to slip, but we're, 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 we're feeling, um, feeling confident that we've got a pathway here. New Bedford is the main staging area. Um, we'll talk about some of the ports there, as well as um, the, uh, as well as Martha's Vineyard uh, slated for the uh, operations and maintenance facility, which will be the long-term sort of operations and command center for the project. Um, we are, I, I know I've been a little long-winded in some of my answers here, so I will try and get through some of this quicker. Um, Park City Wind, which was awarded at the end of 2019, we're about just a year and change after having been awarded that, has very similar fundamentals to, um, to Vineyard Wind One. We're talking about a similar size, built, being built just adjacent to Vineyard Wind One. Um, we are also talking about a, a, a transmission corridor that runs right close and parallel. We wanna keep that infrastructure sort of in the smallest overall footprint in the ocean. Um, in this case, um, due to ag agreements with, uh, with, with Connecticut, um, Bridgeport comes into play to be a major staging uh, center and also the, the site of uh, construction and oper excuse me, operations and, and maintenance for this project. Um, and we anticipate about two and a half years behind Vineyard Wind One um, in terms of moving through that state, federal, and, and, and local uh, permitting process. Uh, and then our final, our final sort of design and, um, and, and, uh, and construction commencement. Um, we wanted to show this map just to folks locally. You know, the blue line is one we've seen a, a fair amount before. We're starting in Cobles Beach, moving roughly due north to connect over at Independence Park next to the Eversource substation. And then you'll see a bunch of potential lines on the, on the west, uh, to the west of that, which are the um, sort of this is how the envelope is crafted. And you would have seen a similar thing a couple of years ago from Vineyard Wind One, where, where we, we seek to permit a range of alternatives so that community concerns, logistical concerns, um, concerns with cultural resources or any other issues um, may, that may arise, allow us the optionality to be flexible. Um, the, the, the solid yellow is our primary um, route, but uh, the, other, the others are seen as feasible at this point and ones we'll sort of pursue through permitting. And, and, and this will, will, will steadily shrink down to a single, uh, single option um, as we get uh, towards the end. This uh, project is supposed to, is slated to connect over at the West Barnstable substation. And we'll be building some of our own infrastructure over on Shoot Flying Hill Road. Um, I talked a fair amount about this, but just to get into the details a little bit, you know, the commitments to the town, time of year restrictions, curb to curb repavement, uh, you know, to the town's liking, so we're not just patching the roads. Um, uh, beach parking lot improvements. Um, we're build, rebuilding a bathhouse there. Um, substation design was a major concern that we, we live on our sole source aquifer, uh, and and uh, we need to do better than than, what, than than the minimum as far as contain. We had an extensive discussion, wide ranging, with the town of Barnstable uh, about water concerns and about ensuring that we're building the state of the art uh, a, a substation facility that will provide the utmost protection and redundancy to ensure that we don't have any impacts there. Um, there's a lot of property tax revenue associated with that infrastructure for the town. Um, and then we're doing a, a host community agreement payment over time of $16 million. We've also, um, we've also uh, uh, committed to working with the town to co-locate sewer because it just so happens that those lines I showed you before run through arguably the most prime uh, need for sewer infrastructure, uh, maybe even on the Cape, but certainly in Barnstable. Um, so that's been part of their long-term goal and obviously a pressing issue for all of us on Cape Cod. And we're, we're pleased that we're gonna be able to sort of get a two for one, save the town some money and be able to build that infrastructure alongside our project. It'll also result in less community disruption with just one road opening, uh, but, but a really important local, you know, the local, local environmental issue of our time on the Cape is wastewater. And the, you know, along with the global issue, of course, that we're, we're trying to tackle at least in part with uh, clean energy. Um, I can skip through some of this and hope maybe there's be some questions involved, but New Bedford uh, Commerce Terminal 
uh, is is the you know the space. Uh, it's been ready for many years. So I was anticipated to be the staging area for Cape Wind. Uh, we we've, we've released that area and we'll be using it for Vineyard Wind One um, to move much of the infrastructure um, on you know in and and, and around and, and then offshore. Um, and in Bridgeport, that's that lower left. Um, we'll, that'll be the main main staging area. We've got an area located for uh, the transition pieces, which is that the sort of uh, the yellow piece you see that uh, makes the transition from the mono pile to the uh, to the to the turbine pool. Nate, we had um, a question come in from Rich um, to me privately. The, is the hurricane barrier that exists around New Bedford Harbor does that determine logistically what you do uh, both within that barrier and beyond? Or could you just briefly go over the impact of that if there is? Any Sure. Yeah. Broadly, I can say that, you know, it, it, it is like anything with these projects. It, it is a, um, you know, a consideration. Um, and there is, you know, there is some need, I think, I think for workarounds, uh, but, but, but um, you know, we've, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're comfortable with the plan um, as, you know, as, as stated. When we, when one of these things with this industry, as it's moving forward, becoming more rapidly, more efficient is we're seeing infrastructure, uh, you know, become larger. And so, um, you know, I, th I think there were some upgrades needed to be done to the New Bedford Commerce Terminal there in the upper left uh, to accommodate for a turbine blade size that, you know, if the turbine output is doubled, which is about right uh, from when they began this thing, um, you're seeing at least a 30% increase in size um, of, of, of items. And, and of course, at some point, there's a breaking point where you can't turn a turbine blade or you can't bring a, um, a monopile through. Um, so yeah, there there is there you know there are some considerations to, you know, you need to be made um, with the with the port of New Bedford, but but it is still you know it is still an ideal uh, place on the northeast for 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 staging this project. Thank you. Um, sorry, I've got some of these highlights here. And the marine terminal in the in, on the right is is that that's the uh, sort of mock up of our our planned um, operations and maintenance facility. So that will be where where um, you know upwards of fifty technicians and uh, and professionals will be monitoring. Uh, and monitoring the wind farm uh, from shore, and then and then having using vessels to go out to do maintenance uh, and any kind of repairs. Um, how often, speaking on that note, we had a question from sure. Elaine. How often do these turbines need maintenance? That's a good question. It is known. It is well known, and I do not have the answer for you. Um, but I will. I will be uh, be happy to follow up offline. Uh, it's good. It, 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 it's refreshing to hear a question that I'm not able to answer uh, right, right off the bat. Yeah, that's really, really, uh, that's a fundamental piece of the way that these projects are sort of speculated and even permitted as far as like what amount of, of trips per day or per week are, are needed to, to, uh, to service them. Um, so so it, it, is, it, is, it is well known, but um, I, will, I will check up on that uh, for you. Thank you. Um, so I can just show you kind of, you've seen, seen a lot of this, we've kind of touched on it. Um, Starts with onshore transmission and under cables under roads, um, a transition under the beach. We'll be using HDD. I've got a slide on that for you. There's an offshore electrical service platform, which is essentially an offshore substation. Uh, and then inter-array cables. Each turbine is sort of con connected in a daisy chain style um, to, uh, to that, that platform. Um, and then, uh, you know, that's, that's the essence of... Um, of you know the entire development proposal, of course, it's far more complicated than that. Um, you can see these areas, uh, you know, down below. It's a lot of infrastructure. Um, we're of course with 62 turbines, um, you know, it's it's becoming fewer and fewer, but but a bit larger as well. Uh, mentioned the GE Halyard X turbine is 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 is, is you know was really wonderful uh, that we were able to bring this in. Uh, admittedly, it caused at least a brief delay, but um, fewer turbines, of course means a reduced footprint, um, greater, you know, greater reductions, greater efficiency per, per unit put out there. Um, 13 megawatts is, 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 is really an astounding number. Um, you know, that means ultimately um, a single one of these turbines can, can supply 6,500 homes. So in Provincetown right now, you have to get to the middle of Wellfleet before you get to you know, feeding, feeding, uh, feeding that many homes. In fact, I think you have to go beyond Wellfleet. Um, to, to get there. So, so we're seeing an efficiency that really bodes well for all stakeholders, uh, you know, whether it's, whether it's the rate payer, whether it's marine users, um, whether it's folks concerned about endangered species, it, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, ra it's rapidly evolving and it's, and it's very exciting. Um, some specs on this, what we're talking about, um, the hub height, you know, we're, we're talking about about 451 feet off the deck. Um, 
And, uh, and this is right about at the upper bound of what our uh, original proposal to Boehm, you know, our, um, our envelope proposal was, was to say, um, we are um, building within these parameters. So, so we, we've, we've kind of reached the upper bound of that parameter, which is exciting. We had to make an adjustment with respect to the 13 megawatt turbine, but again, reducing the footprint was, um, was certainly a positive development for all. Um, well, we can walk our way up to these, uh, these bigger ones. They're already talking about bigger turbines. Um, and uh, it's 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 moving um, it's moving fast. And what's ironic is that you think we're getting bigger, we're going uncharted territory. The bigger you get, ironically, you know, every new turbine model comes with actually an or, a degree of greater reliability, um, because you know, with, with each with each turbine, more is learned, uh, more software and hardware is is refined. Um, <clears throat> we've uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the electrical grid connection is a is a critical component to this. Um, many years of of, of offshore research and work. Um, it's ultimately a cable that is, and I'll show you the cables here, which many of you have seen. Those three cores can carry, um, it's two 400 megawatt cables. So just six of those copper cores, uh, you know, se separated into two cables can carry the entire bulk of, of, of uh, Vineyard Wind One, uh, which means, you know, 400,000 homes worth of power moving through those three, those two, you know, two sets of those three cores. Onshore, they split them into their individual components. There's a data cable that is, is put in place there also to, to uh, you know, allow obviously for, for you know, high level communication. Um, I mentioned HDD, this is kind of a really exciting thing. They've used it in Falmouth to connect the islands. Um, you know, we go deep below the beach. So we only disrupt the parking lot. Um, the beach itself is not disrupted and, and, and critically you get 30 feet below the beach at the tideline in that dynamic area. Um, so, so a, you know, extreme degree of confidence that that, there, that erosion issues in the, in the human environment won't be a, won't be a factor. Yeah, um, folks will like this one. Uh, the, you know, there are a couple of tool options to do this offshore installation. Uh, the vertical injector is the um, is the one on the right, um, which, you know, kind of an amazing thing. I mean, we're trying to do minimally invasive work here, so you're talking about about fluidizing um, a section of seabed that's just a few feet wide, and then pulling that cable through. Um, so that you're, you're you're minimizing disturbance, and, and additionally, you're kind of leaving the seabed as stable as possible to um, to limit or or eliminate you know, the chance that you're going to have a sort of greater disruption um, to you know put the sea, put if you put the cable in a disturbed area that if you're you know so if you're minimizing disruption on the seabed, you're able to um to to be 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 sure that that cable is going to remain several feet below the seabed. Um, there are cable protection uh, you know potential needed. We, we've routed really to minimize the need for cable protection. But we're talking about, um, you know, rock piles or concrete mattresses that will ensure that that cable is, you know, is fully protected and then doesn't need, of course, you know, any kind of, um, uh, you know, heavy-duty maintenance if there's if there's any kind of damage to it. Um, this is something we 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 you know make every effort to minimize, um, but but you know creates a more stable situation uh, when we do that offshore installation. Um, can skip some of this stuff. I mean, there are many, many, many. Uh, you know, devices, everything from video to, to really high-tech sonar work um, and, um, and, and, you know, physical sampling of the seabed um, that, that leads us not only to turbine location assessment, but also uh, critically the, that, um, that export cable. Um, it's, it goes everything down to, is it, you know, is there complex bottom that we want to avoid? Is there, is there um, eelgrass that we want to avoid all the way to sort of what is the the, the, the makeup of this and, and how easily can we make sure we bury this cable uh, deeply and permanently. Hey, we've had some question, um, a question about sure. the job. So I'm wondering if you want to go to your um, yeah. why don't I, why don't I skip through this? development. And I'll just show you. Yeah, there's a bunch of nerd nerd uh, slides there that, that, that I'm happy to go in with into with folks. That's really, when you get into it, it's very exciting stuff, what the science they're pulling from the, uh, from the seafloor is. But um, workforce is, is a major thing. We've got to build an industry that's matured over a quarter century in Europe in just a couple of years. And with the Biden administration's announcement, you can tell there's demand. There's thousands of people needed to build each of these projects directly. And then the downstream, you know, gets into the, into the tens of thousands, the second, third, and fourth tier suppliers. So it's everything from people supplying boats um, with their critical supplies all the way down to, you know, caterers even, you know, and, and, and other things. We, we're reaching out um, to marine users, uh, including fishermen, to help with surveys and those kinds of things. Um, it's of course, as you can imagine, a massive effort when you when you think about it. Um, so we're in the later stages of planning, and we're really queuing up the construction um, work now. And then the operations and maintenance 
is um you know involves fewer jobs but but these long term you know decades long careers in um in you know sort of uh, it's everything from the marine tech and um and, and offshore wind uh, technician jobs um to you know desktop jobs in terms of monitoring and those kinds of things and then administrative and support services um so you know safety training is especially coming from europe it, it, it's it's at an extraordinarily high level um you know recruiting folks is interesting there are so many marine you know ex people who have a lot of marine experience which is great because that means you've got people with good sea legs you know they don't get seasick they can handle themselves on a boat um you know you think of mass maritime you think of you know folks in the fishing industry and marine trades already we've got um we've got a, a good resource to tap but there is added um added uh you know uh, expertise that is needed for the specifics of offshore wind. And it does become this sort of, um, you know, mariner thing where it's, especially during construction, there'll be folks off offshore for several days at a time uh, doing these projects. Um, so we're working with, with a bunch of facilities, um, excuse me, a bunch of organizations, including Mass Maritime, the community colleges, trade schools. Um, we're working with, with organized labor to develop some of these, these, um, these assets. Um, a, a group out on, on Martha's Vineyard that we're doing training with uh, that, that lead, will lead to the O&M uh, jobs, um, the UMass system um, and, and a bunch of other organizations and, and those actually that are already doing a lot of them offshore marine training. Um, we're, we're sort of needing to turn some of those things about 10 degrees to, to make sure that they fit specifically with, uh, with offshore wind. Um, I guess I can stop there and I apologize for having eaten up so much of the time, but we can stand for a couple more minutes if, uh, if folks are able to. Yeah, that'd be great if, if you guys don't mind hanging on for a few minutes. We had some great questions sure. coming from the audience. So if you have time, um, I can bring up a couple of those. So Excellent. I asked, I, I admit, I asked Rose to give me as much of the tech heavy stuff as she could. <laughs> and I, think she, uh, I think she answered the call. So, yes. um, so uh, we had a lot there, but we're happy to follow up as well with folks. Uh, you know, if we run out of time here, you got to jump. So an interesting one from Jane related to maybe cable placement and, you know, the subsea um, interaction that the project is having. She asked, is there any opportunity to add kelp farming in any way with the wind farm or cable placement? I don't know if that's something you guys have um, come across in your work. We might have lost her. Sorry. Uh, we, yeah, we've, we've heard these, we heard, heard, we've had broad discussions and heard these proposals. Um, you know, they are exciting. I think one of the, the limiting factors is we're building these projects upwards of 20 miles offshore. And we're building them naturally in, in um, some of the harshest environments. That's what we want, right? Um, we want high, we want high and consistent winds and below high and consistent winds are often high and consistent waves. Um, so, you know, there is, there is an openness to, um, to, to, you know, pursuing pilots and things like that, 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 that we could, um, you know, uh, incorporate. But I think what you're seeing is that's often been a feature of, um, or often, or it's, it's some instance, been a feature of, of projects that are far closer to shore. So if we were building a couple of miles off of, off of a, a shore, you know, with a, a port two or three miles away, you can imagine a, a, maybe perhaps a more natural fit with some sort of add-on um, to, uh, you know, to aquaculture um, or, or something like that. But I think, I think we're seeing a, a bit of a limit um, as, as we get that far offshore uh, from, from those types of operations. So what we'll probably be seeing is, um, you know, I, I, I don't, we haven't heard, get, gotten the synergy yet, but we're, we're, we're of course open to it if, um, you know, if there are uh, folks who are looking to be entrepreneurial in kelp farming or aquaculture. And another one from Rich related to the project area itself. Um, he asked if you could speak, is there any truth about uh, if there are concerns about insurer permission for sea tugs or scallopers or fishermen to move um, in the vineyard wind area once that's built? Um, I guess there's a fear of these transit lanes may cause insurer limits on whether people can travel, whether the boats sure. can travel through them. Yeah, yeah. Well, so you know, stepping back, we were talking about in Vineyard Wind One and 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 by the by the agreement, the one by one agreement, um, the most sparse by an order of magnitude, most sparsely separated wind farms um, that that have been conceived, and. What we know from Europe, there have been some place, spaces in Europe, and I think in the earlier going, and it's with certain countries and the features of their, of you know the way they approach regulation. Um, there has been, um, you know, there have been exclusion in Europe in some in some of those projects, and I think in far more dense ones. That's not um, going to be the approach, and hasn't been the approach, and won't be the approach that um, the U.S. takes. Um, so, 
with one nautical mile separation, is that a, um, you know, is that, is that a concern that's going to, that's going to uh, make insurers um, wary? Uh, I would put that against the context of the active fishing that's occurred, uh, you know, in Europe, uh, around European fishing, um, excuse me, European offshore wind facilities. Um, I can't, I can't answer specifically to the, um, you know, to the, you know, I'm not, not a, a marine insurer, but, um, and I know there's been a lot of discussion about this, but um, I think with, you know, stepping back, it, it seems, it seems unlikely. Thank you. Um, and another good one from Jane relative to um, the permitting that you guys are doing onshore and Barnesville have done. I missed the status. I apologize. Um, how She asked, how can we submit input to recommend that the road repavement criteria include shoulders or bike lanes for safe cycling, since that's such an important part of the summertime uh, community? Yeah. That's a great, that's a great question. We, we've always, and that's part of the reason we try to get out there and get community input. Um, I know that in some instances, uh, the town, and this is really a discussion in the town because the town kind of calls the shots on what the roadway is going to look like at the end. Um, and if you want to expand shoulders or do those other things, it's sort of a separate process. I do know the town has, has, has sought to do, um, I think some, some, some sidewalk repairs in certain elements of Interview One. So, I mean, we welcome that, of course. Um, it's just a matter of, we don't, we're not the ones who determine um, you know, the spatial planning of, um, you know, spatial planning of, of, of the onshore works. It, it's still the town's roads. We're just basically been, we're going to be given an easement for a small um, portion under, you know, several feet under the road to put our cables and have to kind of do what the town uh, wants us to do uh, up above. But, but, it, but those ideas are absolutely welcome. Um, we, we love to capture those. I mean, the sewer thing was basically the town saying, hey, we got these sewer plans. Let's, let's make this work. Um, and, and, and I think we could do that with any other things that are supported by the community. Thanks. Uh, and maybe the last one, unless Danny, you've received any is, um, are there specifically, are there opportunities for people on the Cape to make their voice heard in the federal process moving forward with respect to offshore wind and more generally, um, what do you recommend for people who want to be involved both at the local, regional, uh, state, and federal level in, in advocating for the project. I've talked enough here. I'm losing my voice. I don't know, Dana, if you want to capture that one. There's a lot. <laughs> oh, well, certainly uh, keeping in touch with us, uh, going on our website and signing up for any updates we have is uh, helpful. Then you'll know sort of the flow of what's going on. And I'm sure if there's ever a time when we need uh, people to sign on. So it seems like things are moving in a direction that's hospitable. Uh, you'd be the first to know in, in that uh, way. And certainly keeping in touch with me, uh, my email, my number, I think will be uh, given at the end. And if not, Austin can give uh, my number. I've given it out in chat to a few people and uh, you always have access to me, but uh, just talking to your friends about it as well, spreading the word about why you think it's a good idea and why you think it's important. I think that's probably one of the most important things to do is to keep the conversation going. Like, this is great. We've got, I don't know, 20 people here, but if each of you talk to four or five people, it really expands the messaging and uh, lets people know that this is, this is a real thing, it's happening, and it's, uh, it's a very positive move for, uh, for us, not only with the environment, but with, uh, with job creation. It's old and new. I was talking uh, with a couple of people from the uh, Longshoremen's Union, and they're they're going to have a whole new industry to work in. Like this is reinvigorating what they do, so it's it's exciting across the board. Mm -hmm. And I was asked Nate about the final cost of it, which I don't want to give an answer to because I'm not. I don't want to miss final that cost. Answer. Yeah, well, with respect to cost, so we we bid and I, it may have glossed over this. We bid into Massachusetts. Massachusetts chose this project, um, based in part, in large part, on on its affordability, um, and we beat out other competitors based on affordability. So it's a competitive process that obviously benefits the ratepayer. Um, so I mean, final cost is is, is ultimately determined by that contract. Um, and while we can talk about the levelized price, and actually I would almost want to hand it over to Austin to give us uh, a schooling on, on some of that stuff because he's an expert. But, uh, you know, we're, we are talking about an anticipated savings as according to the, uh, the, the state uh, who did an analysis and asserted against business as usual, there'll be well over a billion uh, potentially in savings on ratepayers' bills. And then you add to that, you know, the economic development and the capture there. Um, and get even more complex, and I would certainly hand this over to Austin as far as, as, far as what, the, what the sort of 
you know, cumulative overall benefits of bringing this resource into the mix um, that, ha that produces um, a lot of energy at times when energy is most scarce, like in you know, the coldest days in January, there are a lot of sort of downstream benefits that ultimately end up um, you know, benefiting our, you know, our bills, but in a, in a less direct way than the specific ratepayer um, rate payer bill, which, which, is, uh, which is an advantage for us. Um, and the overall cost in, 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 the, in the realm of two and a half billion is what people typically are citing as the cost for a project of this size. I can't actually speak to the very specific, you know, uh, dollar amount of, of what, what the uh, capital cost is anticipated, but that's what the, the sort of, you know, broad industry watchers say. Well, thank you both. We're about 10 minutes past nine. So I just want to thank you again for taking the time to join us this morning. It's a great presentation you put together with a lot of information. Um, if it's okay with you, I might connect with you afterwards to hopefully we can make this available um, on our website for those that are interested in. And um, thank you again uh, for joining us and, and all the great information. So I'll always a pleasure. I'll, and hanging around late to answer questions. So I appreciate that. I'm going to hand it back over to Bert to close us out. Austin, thanks so much. Great job moderating. And uh, Dana and uh, Nate, very much appreciate your presentation today. Uh, really great news to see this this project coming along so far. Uh, you know, we've been watching it for for so many years, and looking forward to the next steps. So thanks so much for your time today. Uh, we will have the video available for, uh, for everyone uh, in a few days. And otherwise, I look forward to seeing you all at the next time. So thank you all for being here. Thank you for supporting the Tech Council. And we'll see you again next time.